I have miles and miles ahead of me Tales to listen to, time to spend Up ahead the road is dimly Wonder what's around the bend Hello, I'm Charles Kuralt. We're off again to meet a few people on the back roads of America. These are people you know, not from the front pages. They've never been on the front pages. They're people you know from next door and down the block. Their stories are some of my favorites from 25 years on the road. Sad to say, the more trips you take out on the road, the more the roads begin to blur a little in memory. Some roads, however, do not blur. This one, for instance. This was the high road once from Yuma to Holtville, the only road made of planks laid on the desert sand. It goes nowhere now. It only leads one to wonder. To this place, there never was a road, only the trackless ocean, but the millions who crossed the ocean never forgot their arrival here. The only thing that kept me going, I guess all of the other immigrants too, is that right across the water, you can see the land of opportunity. And then you, you look as you enter the harbor and you see the Statue of Liberty. Now, everybody knows what the Statue of Liberty is, uh, even whether they know a bit of English or not. There it was, and you knew you were in America. They landed on Ellis Island, Italian or Greek or German or Hungarian. They left Ellis Island, American. But memories can be lost if they're not cherished and safeguarded. To Beaufort, North Carolina now, to hear a tale of the past not told, but sung. For countless generations, the Manhattan fishermen have been setting out to sea from Beaufort, North Carolina. The fish swim in schools of millions. They've been netted since Indian times for fish oil and fertilizer. Menhaden fishing never has been easy work and still isn't, even on Captain Bobby Martin's boat rigged with winches and pumps. They don't exactly jump on this boat. We had to get down and work, get them more here, you know, but it's, it's nowhere near like it used to be. It used to be harder. That is something Captain Martin does not have to tell the three honored guests he has with him this trip. They know how it used to be. John Henry Pritchard knows. 50 years ago, the Manhattan boat on which he was working went down in Beaufort Harbor. 17 of his shipmates drowned that day or froze to death before anyone could get to them. John Henry Pritchard knows how it used to be. On that back, back, on that back, back, yonder, you know, on that bridge, ice had froze up a solid, solid post of ice. About four of them back there through them holes. John Jones does too. And so does John Bell. He remembers. And it got so rough, we had to let the fish go. And we tried to take our boats up. This is how it used to be. They didn't have any hydraulic winches to pull their nets. They had strong arms. The nets weighed thousands of pounds. If the men did not pull together, steadily, powerfully, fold by gathered fold of the net, all exactly at once, the catch might be lost. They might be lost, overboard, with the enormous slipping weight of what they held in their hands. To get themselves pulling together to lift the nets, to lift their spirits, they sang. Roseanne, Roseanne, you are so sweet. Bye-bye, bye-bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye, my darling child. I won't be home. Tomorrow. 
Mike Luster of the North Carolina Maritime Museum had heard about the hauling shanties the old Menhaden men sang. And I said, is there anyone around who remembers these songs? Who sang, who sang lead with these songs? He said, John Jones, and he lives right over here. Mike Luster discovered that other retired Menhaden men were still to be found on shore. Before long, 13 of them were getting together most every Friday night, trading stories of how it used to be, and singing the shanties that got them through the hard, cold work at sea. so cold your hand was swell and bust and you still had to pull you had to carry your load and so you start singing them shiny song that give you spirit to go on and that the way it was you had to learn how to pull now, as you pull one hand, you catch the other hand to pull. You pull again, you throw it this way. Next time, you throw it that way. You keep it level, so you have a level place, so you can have your balance. Keep your balance. As you pull in there, then you throw it so it'll be level. Keep pulling, keep pulling, keep pulling, keep pulling. This is the kind of straining work where you give it your all, all that you got. You're gonna take all you got to get them up and everybody knows that. And then somebody want to put some joy into it or either some sorrow into it. See the Shanty song, either bring joy or either sorrow. So when they sang that shanty, oh, me. Oh, they, they, something else happened to you. Start singing something like, I left my baby standing in the back door crying. Come on, boy, let's get these feet. I left my baby. Well, well. If you ask John Jones or John Bell why they're doing what they're doing, they're saying to keep this, these songs alive, to hand it on to the next generation. We almost lost these songs, and they want to hand it on. And it's not just Menhaden fishermen's heritage. It's, it's the heritage of the Gandhi dancers. It's the heritage of the mule skinners. It's the heritage of the agricultural workers. Uh, it's, it's the American heritage. Not long ago, the shanty singers of Beaufort, North Carolina, did something they never dreamed they'd do. They went north to Carnegie Hall in New York City to show people how it used to be to bring the nearly forgotten songs of the Menhaden men back to life again. Would it have mattered, really, if these songs had been lost? Well, slender cords are made strong when they are twisted together into rope or knotted into net. Aren't men made strong just that way, by being bound together? 
And isn't history a net of memories knotted together? There would have been a big hole in the net of memory if these strands had been lost. fast in America, and we rarely look back to see where we've been. The drivers who roar through the desert on Interstate 8 never notice the brave, scarred remnants of an earlier road, which must have been one of the most remarkable roads ever built in America, the Yuma to Holtville Highway. It was eight feet wide, made of heavy wood planks held together by bolts and rails, and up until 1927, if you wanted to drive west to California across this part of the desert, this is what you drove on. The shifting sand dunes have covered most of the road now, but enough is left in short stretches, preserved by the dry heat of the desert, to cause a visitor pausing here to speculate. Wonder what happened if you were driving this road and met another car? What happened when the wind piled sand on the road in drifts? You waited, probably, for the wind to blow the other way. There must have been breakdowns on the road. What happened then? We've come so far in this country, so fast, that answers to questions like that are already buried in the sand. When was this road built? During World War I, apparently. But who built it? And who maintained it? And who were the adventurous motorists who wanted so much to go from Arizona to California that for more than a decade they ventured out on it through the sand dunes, knowing it would be 50 miles before they came to another town. We would like to ask somebody, but everybody around here is going 70 miles an hour. There's nobody to ask. Primarily, the reason I emigrated was to seek a better life, as did thousands of other people. The boat had three classes. There was a first class, small, second class, a little larger, and then steerage or third class. That's where we were. That hope to be in America was so great that the, it covered all the pain that we had. An imposing building of brick rising up from a bit of land in the middle of New York Harbor. For more than 12 million Americans, this was landfall in the New World. Ellis Island was all that stood between them and America. It was the end of a very, very uh, uh, problematic journey because you didn't know what you were getting in for. You're taking all the shots, you had all your papers, your hopes and good things, and you wonder. So you wanted to get here, you had to go through this. It was an ordeal, you had to go through. There's no way out of it. Manny Steen came to America from Dublin, Ireland in 1925. He was 19 years old. The only thing that kept me going, I guess all of the other immigrants too, is that right across the water, you can see the land of opportunity. And then you, you look as you enter the harbor and you see the Statue of Liberty. Everybody knows what the Statue of Liberty is, uh, even whether they know a bit of English or not. There it was, and you knew you were in America. But not quite yet in America, not yet free. Before freedom came medical examinations and questions and long lines and the ever-present chance of being turned away at America's door. The Statue of Liberty was the shining promise of freedom. Ellis Island was the gritty reality. It was devastatingly complicated here. Uh, you were being shoved around. You, you just did whatever you were told. The guards, I guess, had no time to uh, uh, explain matters, so you just did whatever you were pushed. That's where you went. 
it was crowded and of course people speaking all kinds of languages sounded like listening to someone speaking in tongues because you couldn't understand any of it. Brigitte Fitchter was six years old when she and her mother arrived on Ellis Island from Sweden in 1924. We had to sleep in, in a dormitory, double bunk beds, and my mother and I slept in, in the one bed together, very close together. And uh, they um, had to feed us, so they put us in a, in a big dining hall with long, long tables, everybody sitting, you know, one after the other. And all they gave us was uh, a piece of bread. They passed the loaf of bread down the table, and you just took a piece of bread off and passed it on to the next one. During the busiest years from the 1890s to the 1920s, thousands of people flooded into Ellis Island every day, Italians and Irish and Greeks and Hungarians and Russians and Poles, a flood tide of people from every corner of the earth, speaking different languages, wearing different clothes, holding different beliefs. But they had one thing in common, no matter where they came from, they wanted to become Americans. The relatives of one in three of us came through here. For a hundred million of us, this is Plymouth Rock. And then, even more suddenly than it sprang from New York Harbor, Ellis Island was abandoned. Everything that had been part of life here was left to crumble. Tables and chairs and an old piano that must have lifted a few spirits once. The walls that had contained so many hopes were left to molder and decay. It is fitting, then, that the Great Hall has been made to shine brighter than it ever did before. Ellis Island is now a museum of immigration, a long overdue monument to all the people who had the courage to say goodbye to family and friends and home and to cross an ocean or two in search of a better life. We're representing in the Treasures from Home exhibit at Ellis Island uh, material from over 60 different ethnic groups and nationalities. Um, from all over Europe, as well as Asia, China, Japan. Fred Wasserman is part of a team of historians that has gathered treasures for the museum from attics all across America. People brought whatever they had. Some of the things are very, very special, um, kind of precious to people. And, uh, and some of the things are just sort of uh, very ordinary, mundane kinds of things. Um, you know, an, an Italian immigrant uh, Giovanni Strumisi brought this key from his house in Biella, Italy. Uh, so in case he ever went back, you know, he could go to his ancestral home and he'd be able to get in. <laughs> Philip Lowe brought this compass with him from China so that he might find his way in America. Nathan Salman brought a candy wrapper from his family's store in Poland and his mother's candy recipes, handwritten in Yiddish. There are photographs and bits of cloth, even bits of the old country that were pocketed away and saved. When it's complete, it's beautiful. Ellis Island will open its doors again, and a new wave of visitors will fill this hall. Those people who got this far and were stopped. People like Manny and Mary Steen, who have made a good life here. I look back and uh, I'm grateful to America. I uh, try to give back more than I got. And people like Brigitte Fitchter and her son and his daughter, all Americans now, who will pass through the doors of Ellis Island. They are not fearful this time. They are proud of what they have accomplished in this new world. Well, time to say goodbye until our next trip together. We've heard about a story up the road here, but we kind of hope we never get there. With luck, we'll stumble upon something more interesting along the way. 
I can see the road is bending. Wonder what's around the bend. All these years I've been a wonder Just when I think I'm near the end I always see the road is bending And I wonder what's around the bend 